All right, today we're gabbing with Evan Ross Katz, host of the Shut Up Evan podcast, writer of the newsletter of the same name, co-host of Drop Your Buffs podcast, all about Survivor. I could go on. You, you guys know Evan Ross Katz, and he has been on the list of people that I've wanted to have on the show since I started it last year. So Evan, I really appreciate you being here. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to chat with you because I don't really have a forum to talk housewives much these days. And so I feel like a lot of these thoughts are festering in my brain. So I'm excited to chat with you. Good. And I feel like the last time I saw you was at the Watch What Happens Live anniversary party. But we, but, but I was thinking about it. And I, I think the first time we ever met in person was that, remember when we went to that random masterclass little concert that Christina Aguilera did? And it was for like 40 people. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that she was saying like four bizarre. songs yes yeah yeah but weren't there like there were other people that were also a part of that it's like she was like a feature of like a larger uh lineup of programming so then i i remember her like coming and like sitting in the front row and just watching the rest of the event unfold yes it was it was interesting but it was also a private christina aguilera concert so like no complaints we'll never say no to that <laughs> so i wanted to have you on to talk about roni because i feel like just from following you over these years, like Roni feels like it's something that's close to your heart. It's close to mine. You've interfaced with some of these women over the years, obviously. But talk to me just quickly at the beginning, just about like your relationship to OG Roni over the years. Mm, okay, so I was watching Roni. I think I started watching at the beginning of season two. So I'm okay. not, wasn't there from the outset, but was an early adopter. Um, and... I would say my favorite housewife of all time is Alex McCord. And I mentioned that just to sort of like give people a perspective on like the kind of wife that I kind of enjoy most okay. on the show, which is that I really like authentic delusion in my housewives. And I think that we've reached the sort of like, there's now a meta layer of delusion, yeah, which can always. still sometimes work. It's that's I, I yeah, I, I'll take a delusion in any form I can have it. But that Alex McCord really for me is like, baseline housewife i think it's also why danielle staub really takes off and her first go round for me um kim richards another great example so so for me roni was always it i i feel like of all of the shows no cast on the whole has had more electricity amongst it i guess you know as i'm saying this out loud i can kind of say well atlanta season five yeah you know totally. like there is that like yeah so like they're not it's not unprecedented but i feel like roni's had the the best run of integrating new women into the fold with great success and i just think there's a quality about new york and a sensibility and a humor that no other franchise has been able to touch so i feel I do love a lot of the franchises, but I just have, I mean, and I think also we're New Yorkers. So there's a home turf aspect to it where um, I just, I think I'm always going to have a sweet spot in my heart for Roni, even the, you know, dark years, if you will, like thinking about what was it? Season 13. Um, even With then. The I Leah and back, Ebony season. Yeah. I go back okay. now and I watch it and I'm like, there's still greatness to be found. in. That's interesting in that. because, because I feel like there's this, you know, we'll get to the reboot, but I feel like in the discourse around the reboot, there's this argument that's been made by some people that like, there's maybe some revisionist history about how, you know, OG Roni, the form that it was in towards the end of its run, because it wasn't in its heyday, it wasn't necessarily the best Housewives franchise out there. Do you agree with that? Because it sounds like you still found things to really enjoy and maybe it didn't get its due at the time. Well, so like, for instance, there will be moments like Black Shabbat, which are sort of looked back on like that, like yeah. moments like clips like that will resurface and people will be like, oh my God, we were down so bad. I don't think that's the case. I think Black Shabbat was really great television. I think what was lacking was Ebony needed an ally on that season. And so for me, when I look back at 13, I just think there were some missing elements. The show felt, I remember like the cast trip on 13 and I was just like, it just feels so quiet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that if I could go back for 13, it's just, it wasn't that 13 was like this out and out mess. It just was like between the loss of Bethany and the loss of Tinsley yeah. and the fact that and I don't Dorinda. think Eve and Dorinda, oh my God. Yeah. yeah, it's just, there was so much missing. And so I think with 13, it was like, whereas with uh, season five, 
we were able to bring in all of this new blood. I think we needed more new blood with 13 and I don't think we got it. And I think that's what ultimately tripped us up. So wait, oh my God, this is how bad my memory is. So Dorinda wasn't on season 13. No, because remember she got put on pause and then and then there was a season without her. And then I think the idea was obviously that she was going to come back either the next season or the season after. And so you do imagine a world in which instead of completely getting chopped and splitting into two, quote unquote two shows, they could have done a, an OC kind of refresh where like they bring back a Dorinda, they bring back, I don't know, like a Heather Thompson or somebody who could have maybe like worked in another world if Leah hadn't sort of like you know, nipped that in the bud when she first joined in that, in that season 13. So there was a way in which like they could have mixed it up like OC did and not, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and and I guess my like, I don't think it's a hot take, but an opinion that I know a lot of people don't share is like, I am pro Ramona. I am pro Vicky. I am pro featuring right. problematic women on these shows. One, because they've been a fabric of the show from the outset. But two, this show, it does not purport to celebrate these women that appear on it. And so I think watching problematic people acting problematically uh, sort of showcases exactly who they are. So I don't think this show tries to make people like Ramona look good when they act badly. And so I think Certainly that's not. sometimes the way in which people, when, because, you know, I've been a part of this conversation in the past. I remember like, you know, when Kelly Dodd was really acting up, I was amongst the people being like, you know, with my pitchfork being like, get rid of Kelly Dodd. And I think where I've come, to, where I've come to in terms of how I watch these shows is I, I understand that they are entertainment. I understand that these women are not role models, and so I have, think I have a lot, what I would call a healthier relationship with watching bad people acting badly on television and separating entertainment from sort of purporting to think, oh, this is how I want people to behave in society. Yeah, it's like the the way you want people to act on a reality TV show is not the same as the behavior you'd put up with in your real life. And, yes. and, and there's a sort of like moralizing that happens of reality TV shows, and I think kind of in the past four to five years. And that's why Dallas got canceled, to be honest. That's why Brony got rebooted. Like it's, there's an overcorrection. I think that happened because of that fan mentality in some ways. Yes, but I do think there's a heel turn that's happening in that, even in having Mary Cosby back yeah. on Salt Lake City, that sort of signals this shift. Or I'm thinking about, you know, I, I just watched the premiere episode of House of Villains season two, and Richard Hatch, who is like, you know, the OG winner of Survivor, he was not invited to participate in the all winners season of Survivor. And that could be for a number of reasons. I mean, he has his history uh, of tax evasion, but also mm -hmm. there was some 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 problematic behavior during his first uh, run on the all-star season of survivor in terms of an interaction with another cast member that's the kind of thing that because of that he'll i, I shouldn't say never but he's not been invited back to survivor but a show like house of villains is mm -hmm. like hey we'll capitalize on this i think as we start to see more people that are previously quote unquote canceled re-emerging and with great love in the case of uh you know mary cosby is one of the highlights of this, oh, this current season of Salt Lake yeah, City. Carrying. I think it I think it invites more people that previously would have been do not asks into the conversation. Yeah. Well that I think that kind of ties in leads us nicely into the reboot of Roni because you know I think one of my biggest issues with it, we can get into it, is that nobody is really willing to look bad or be the villain or act a little bit, you know, on the on the cusp of of acceptable behavior. When they first announced you know, the cast, you see Jenna Lyons on it and, you know, we see who we're working with. And then you, you watch the beginning of season one. What, what were your, what were your thoughts? Did you see potential in this cast? Did you see, were you excited by it? Is this before I watched season one or after I watched season one? Maybe, maybe just before and then sort of. Um, I, 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 so I wasn't too excited because I remember that interview that Andy did in Variety, I think it was Variety, when it was first announced that it was happening. Yeah. And he, they made it explicitly clear that they were like in search of a friend group. Like that was sort of what mm. was stated at the time. And so I was obviously mourning the loss of the cast of one of my favorite reality shows. But then I was like, okay, there's a possibility here that they're going to find a new group of women that have this same kinetic energy. And so for me, what was the initial disappointment was upon learning, which I think was evident very quickly in watching the first few episodes, that these women don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the promise of the search for a friend group and the reality of them not knowing one another 
not even getting into the fact that some of them I just don't think were or maybe are camera ready. I think that sort of made the first season a little bit of a disappointment for me. And one of my curiosities around, you know, you look at something like New Jersey right now, which they've been explicit about the fact is going to go through some sort of retool. I think one of my questions about the future of Housewives in general is sort of like, how important is the pre-existing connection to a successful Housewives franchise or the alchemy of a, of, of a successful cast? I think that made their, that it made the promise of season two of Ro this Roni reboot, it, it made there be more optimism for me because I was like, okay, well now they're at least... They cool. know each other. They're connected. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I and I kind of think that you know, you look at the Roni reboot, which is still struggling to find its footing. I think it does point to the fact that like there does need to be some sort of connection to the past of the show, to these sort of original, whether it is an OG cast member or somebody who's sort of like a quasi OG. And like Tamara is not necessarily an OG on OC, but she feels of the same ilk of that sort of first era of the show. And before we get to season two, Evan, what did you like about season one? What what was something that 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 was positive to say about it? Yeah, I mean, there was a there was yeah. quite a bit of positive. Um, I mean, I, I will be explicit in saying I I am biased in this conversation. I am friends with Jenna in real life, and so I really did think Jenna was the highlight of mm -hmm. season one. I think there had never been a character like her on this show, both energetically, uh, both in terms of her her stature within the industry that she came up in. You know, I, I think Jenna is, it's obviously known by many people, and especially now, but like Jenna is a big deal in the fashion world. Mm -hmm. uh, no disrespect to Rebecca Minkoff, who is, who is a big deal in her own right, but like Jenna Lyons to me, like that is a name that commands a level of respect. Uh, and interests. So I was just super excited by Jenna and I do think she delivered. Uh, and I also felt like she was able to bring her Jenna-ness, like so, her oddities, which I would sort of, I would, there, to me, there's a dotted line between Jenna and Carol Radziwill. Um, totally. And I thought there was like a quality about Jenna that also was shared by Carol that I just found them really magnetic. So there was, there was Jenna, there was Bryn, who I thought was just really spicy. And I felt like had a Sonia quality of like, you know, stirring the drink. Um, and then there was Jessel, who I think provided a level of X factor in Jessel to me. Again, if we're making more dotted lines here, Jessel was the closest we had Alex to an Alex Record. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say those three for me really popped. I thought there was some dynamics on that cast trip at the end, particularly that fight between Uba and Aaron, which I thought was like exciting. And I've always sort of had an eye on Aaron. I think Aaron me is too. is the most interesting arguably the most interesting amongst all of them, but speaking to something you said earlier, there's a, there's a reluctance from Aaron to be her full self on this show that makes it hard to get on board for her. Um, but I, 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 you know, remain sort of like a, a low key cheerleader for the possibility of Aaron. I think Aaron has good instincts as a housewife in terms of how she kind of mixes it up within the group but when it comes to sharing her life and, just letting that that wolf kind of fully down and not self-producing in that way. That's where she needs to figure it out because she's down to she's down to kind of look bad in terms of how she repeats things to different people and plays the game of tele telephone. Um, but I agree. I think that she has a lot of potential. Bryn, I feel like same thing. She has a lot of potential, but there's just sort of this element of like trying to create a memeable moment and trying to like be a little bit you know, I don't know, like on, it, it's this extra energy that I, I think actually if it's sanded down a little bit and p if she picked her moments even better, she'd be so much more effective. You know what I mean? Yes. But it's, I think especially if, if we gear into season two, it's like they've all watched themselves on TV. And I think that some of them have leaned into the things that they probably saw celebrated on social media, which is, you know, Bryn's probably a great confessional game and these little like cheeky moments that she's had. Jessel, I think. I don't know if it's as unself aware as it was in, in her in their first season. I think now it's like very much a knowing quirkiness, which doesn't feel as much like natural quirkiness anymore. Um, they've all watched themselves, and and that's always and even with singular housewives across different franchises, that's always their second season is always a big test in terms of how they how they kind of course correct or not. Um, but I kind of feel like there was an overcorrection here. Yeah, I would say like the best example of like a second season course correction would be Camille Grammer on season yes, two of Beverly totally. Hills in that obviously she delivered iconography in season one. No one would argue that. But I, I felt like her 
effort to course correct was equally entertaining. Like she came in, was obviously very affected by her perception and wanting to, to flip the script. But what emerged was another interesting facet of Camille that felt true to who she was. I can't think of another, I mean, I, I, obviously there's a lot to think about because there's so many wives and so many franchises, but she to me is the gold standard in terms of like, came in with a self-awareness that didn't impact her ability to be I iconic. Right, totally. And then we also, in season two, we get another sort of stunt casting as, as, that you alluded to, Rebecca Minkoff. You interviewed her for, for Elle before this season. Talk to me about that, about that experience and maybe going into sort of your ideas around the, the necessity for stunt casting in, in a show like this. And just what, what are your thoughts sort of on what, what she presents to the show? So I was really, ex I mean, I work in fashion, so I've yeah. obviously known who Rebecca Minkoff is. And for those that don't know, like Rebecca Minkoff is a force. She's been yeah. in the industry for, her business has been around now for two decades. It's a mega multi-million dollar enterprise. Um, I, I've known many a friend that would carry a Rebecca Minkoff bag, particularly mm -hmm. like in the uh, early aughts. So I think it's an exciting prospect, especially when you think about the fact that like, obviously Jen is in the fashion industry, Cy works in the fashion industry, Jessel works in the fashion industry. I think Bryn works tangentially in the fashion industry. That's PR, not intended marketing, to change. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I like the idea of bringing Rebecca into the fold to sort of like veer us more in a direction that creates, if not a friend group, then a shared interest of like the world sure. that they inhabit. I think with Rebecca and I, I observed this in her interview and I've observed it in the two episodes we've seen so far, there's, uh, there's just some, she's not quite ready. I would equate it to Jen Gilbert on season three of Roni, where mm. it's like, I think that like Dorinda came on the scene and it was like, she'd always been there. And with Rebecca, there's a moment in this episode when they're at the blade, uh, I don't know, like the waiting room, whatever you call it. <laughs> and Rebecca Terminal. looks sort of, yeah. And Rebecca looks to I, what I imagine is one of the producers off screen. And I just was like, it's small moments like that. And I know they're insignificant, but it's moments like that that tells Telling. me like, she's not quite ready for the show. Um, and while I think the idea of bringing a Scientologist onto this show and having that be, you know, a talking point is inherently interesting, um, if the rumors are true and that the instance from this episode is the most we're going to get of that conversation, then I ultimately think it's not exciting. What would have been really exciting to me is like Rebecca Minkoff coming on the show being super open about her Scientology and being incredibly lovable and creating this conundrum for viewers that's like, oh, we kind of, we what stand do we do? someone, yeah, right. who we think is morally, we, we don't, we're not- Like Mary sure Cosby almost. Like Mary Cosby, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I don't want to count Rebecca Minkoff out, but I think the demotion to friend of is an indicator for us as viewers that the, that the production does not believe that she gave enough to warrant- Right. giving her an apple. And that sure. to me is sort of the writings on the wall. And also that moment taught me a lot about how the other women are sort of approaching the show as well. Like in any other franchise, somebody saying no comment about their ties to Scientology would have been challenged and that wouldn't have been really tolerated. Sutton Strack would have printed out an article or, you know, somebody would have found screenshots of the picture that she has with Danny Masterson. Like, it's like, I'm sorry, like that's out there, you know? And like other housewives that are a little bit more I don't know, cutthroat and they know how, what, what the viewers want out of this, they yeah. would have challenged that. And I feel like that also e told me equally about Rebecca's approach to the show and what she wants out of it, which is, you know, remind people that her brand exists and maybe sell some more handbags and then get off the show in a season, but also how the other women are kind of willing to have this collective vault and protect one another in a way that I think in some way, to some extent is like probably how every cast operates, but like they're being so overt and I don't know. It's just, it, it's, I feel like a lot's being kept from us and they're all kind of in, you know, on the same playing field about it. Yeah. And just imagine Rebecca trying to get away with what she got away with if she was going, if she was facing off on that blade with Dorinda and Ramona. Exactly. You know what I mean? Beyond. Like it, it would have, they would have been so activated and would have just been like, you know, chirping birds. And so on the one hand, I appreciate that Bryn is moving plot forward, right? Mm -hmm. Like she literally, they got on the plane and she's like, we've got a scene to do. And I'm, you know, page one, act one. 
Uh, but on the other hand, I'm kind of like, it felt really inorganic to be like having that conversation in that moment. So I'm not sure the reckon how to reconcile that because we, we need the scene work, right? Like we, 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 we want to hear about the Scientology. And so on the one hand, I applaud Bryn for giving us a conversation about the thing we're all wondering, but the inorganic nature of it, I, I could feel it. And so it didn't ultimately feel like a really satisfying scene as as much as I think it would have if Rebecca had brought it to the table and the women had pounced on her totally. opening the door. Totally, yeah. And I think something overall with this, at least with season two, and a lot of it feels already sort of circular from season one in terms of the drama that we're dealing with. It's all like blah, 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 texted me this, and then I told this person about it, but I repeated it wrong. And that's just, it's like, I can't even keep track of like, what did Sai say about Rin? And then what did Bryn say about what did Bryn repeat about that Aaron said about Jenna? And like, it's just this sort of, there's all these sort of intricate webs of who said what about who and like nothing, but it's not really substantial. And, and it's all sort of misrepresented, like <laughs> bad faith readings of what we're talking about with each other. And I don't know, it's just, there's something that that's lacking in terms of what we're even like discussing. Yes. Yes. And, and even then, and I, and I don't, I hope this doesn't come off as insensitive, but even when we have this whole thing with with Aaron and her her mom who's very sick and who's who's undergoing chemo, this is something that like this is a great platform to share that story. Of course. Um, and so I think for her that strange like I'm on a TV show and I'm bringing my mom on to go wig shopping, but I'm not willing to talk to the girls, but I'm I'm willing to let them know that I'm going through something, but I don't really want to speak about it. It's like you have to make up your mind here. And I'm constantly in that moment, I'm reminded of like Bethany sharing her relationship with her mom and dad. Yes. I'm reminded of all the stuff with Ramona sharing the stuff with her family. Like this is a show where there is a history of these women sharing great details about like incredible traumas that they've endured. It's kind of a prerequisite of the show. Mm -hmm. Whether you think that that is ethical or not, that's a separate conversation, but like that's the arena that we're playing in. And so I think that for Erin to be this KG, especially given the format and her choice to be on this show, it, it just doesn't, something doesn't quite line up. Right. And I know that you're friends. So if you don't really want to talk about this, this is fine. But I feel like there's a lot of opinions about Jenna not wanting to have her have her partner on the show. But in episode one of season two of the reboot, we're filming with her mother, her partner's mother. And there's this, you know, there's criticism of Jenna not wanting to show her whole life. And she maybe gets a little bit of special treatment by getting away with something like that. What do you think about that? Like, is that fair that Jenna can't? that doesn't show or gets to pick and choose? Is it fair? No, it's it's not fair, but also it's Jenna. And so she gets away with it. I kind of like, right. and also mind you, we got Beckett and right. And so Beckett's been a part of season one. Mm -hmm. Beckett was featured again, Beckett's her son. He was featured again in this episode. Yeah, no, it's not fair. I would say it's then incumbent on Jenna if she's not going to offer up that aspect of her life to recognize that she needs to deliver on other fronts. And so what we need from Jenna, and again, remains to be seen with this season is like Jenna needs to figure out a way to either disclose other parts of her life or be more activated in sort of getting in the mix on other people's drama but like i'm reminded of sonia uh not having her daughter on her show That's for true. the entire run this is not again not uncharted waters here so fair schmear to me like no it's okay. not fair and that's the choice she made and i would rather a jenna without cast than no jenna at all yeah it's, it's hard because jenna is like still the most authentic person on the show and she we have learned a lot about her backstory and I actually do think that already in two episodes of this season, she is more activated within the within the sort of interpersonal drama within the group. And so I think she probably recognized that, that she had to step it up in that capacity. Um, and I think, yeah, I think yeah. too, it's like there was some professional risk for her last season in not knowing how she was going to be received and not knowing if this was ultimately going to be good for not just her brand love scene, but like the brand of Jenna yeah. Lyons, because when you are a Jenna Lyons, like it's a, it's a, it's a institution. And I think coming out of last season, knowing that it was largely well received, I think gives her a little bit more freedom to get in the mud, have a little bit more fun, not be so precious around how she might come off. Because I think, I, again, I'm saying this, I think, I don't know, but I think the moments where she was the most herself were some of her best received moments. So I think she had a very affirming 
first go. And so I think that let, let her hopefully like feel that she can let her hair down more and not have that be something that is going to cost her in any sense of the word. Right. And it, it, this is a weird through line, but, and they're, cause they're very different people, <laughs> but it reminds me of when Larsa came back to Miami and she had this like Kardashian thing to answer for. And she got really challenged on it her first season back by Adriana. But then after that first season back, she really let loose a little bit more because she was like, okay, I, I've answered for this. You know, I've, I've addressed this. Let's move on kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, so I personally like compartmentalize the reboot and the, and the OG Roni. I think this is like a season two of a new show almost. What do you think about that? Just the simple act of comparing it to OG Roni. Is it an unfair? I mean, like in some ways it's sort of setting it up for loss because it's OG Roni, right? And it's, yeah. it's this beloved show. And so I, I'm just trying to push myself to be someone who's like, all right, we're never going to get that show back. That exists. We'll always have it to, as something to rewatch. The women will pop up on different sort of spin off type shows probably forever. But there's still a faction of people I think that will never really fully give this reboot a chance because there's that comparison that's just kind of a layup there. And it's definitely yeah. the same show. Yeah, I mean, I think a mistake was made in yes. not having this be its own franchise. I think it could have been as simple as just calling this show Roni um, mm -hmm. and having the original show be The Real Housewives of New York. Um, granted, that might cause some confusion, but but nonetheless, <laughs> I think that there were this needed yeah. to be its own entity. I think there was something about season 13 and you know how it was received and there not being any reunion that felt very final totally um and so the fact that like we're now you know we're in season 15 of this show but we're talking about it not just you and i but culturally as the second season it makes it it's confusing um and so i think what i'll always wish had happened if they were going to reboot the show and i think this is like pretty much like the consensus opinion is that it should have been some of the ladies from the last season and some new ladies brought into mm -hmm. the fold the same way they did with season five. I don't think there was a need to do an all out refresh. Um, granted, I know the original idea was to have this Roni legacy be its own spinoff show. When that didn't work out, I, I had my hope for season 15 had been that like season 14 was a complete overhaul. And then in season 15, we'd start to bring back some of the girls to sort of, you know, weave it all together. Um, and I'm going to hold out hope. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold out hope. Yeah. I, I think I think the big mistake was if they were going to split it into two shows, they should have announced the OG cast and had that firmed up before giving us the reboot because then there's not this unsatiated desire to have Sonia, Ramona, Luann, Dorinda back on our screens. Like we would have known, okay, we're getting, we are getting them. But yes. then obviously drama happened with that show. We get a girl's trip, which was fun to watch, but it was sort of inconsequential. And yeah, I, I just, it, they set themselves up for failure in so many ways. But I, but that's also like, I don't want the show to fail. That's the other thing. Like I do want the show to succeed and I want it to, to I do want them to do better because I think a lot of them have, have it in them, you know? Yeah. And it's this weird kind of dichotomy of feeling I think that I'll maybe always have with with Roni can I ask you a question about yeah like, your approach to it because I obviously I follow you on Twitter and like you are someone who has a very positive outlook yeah. often about the state of housewives I can be a little bit more negative in my head on it because I think I have this you know this love of the good old days right when of course things used to just be a little bit more unhinged and so is it something that you're conscious about and sort of always wanting to and, and i'm not saying this in a i'm saying this in a i'm truly wondering it's like do you make a decision with sort of like i'm going to view these with an opt because i think that's what i mean to say i think you have an optimism about how you view yeah, these shows and yeah, so is that something you think about in terms of like the tone that you take? Because this is a fandom that because of people like you can really be swayed very easily to think one thing or the other. Because sometimes it's like, I have this, even when I go on Twitter, I'll be like, I loved something. And then I'll see everyone on Twitter is being like, oh, this was shit. And I'll be like, oh, then maybe it was shit. Do you sort of feel that um, that power that you wield in terms of like, and how to use said power about, you know, how people see this? Yeah, I think I generally just in life have more of like a glass half full mentality on a lot of things. But I also think, you know, a lot of online chatter about these shows and maybe pop culture in general can be really can skew negative because it's that sort of the 
that's what that's what performs that's what gets engagement is sort of the snark and and you know the hot takes and like i think that there's still room for me to have that um and i think honestly with roni like that this is where i've probably been the most critical of any of the housewives recently is because i i don't think it's doing i think it's doing a lot wrong you know and yeah i mean i definitely i it's a way to stand out honestly that that i, that I can be a little more positive and optimistic about these shows um but I also am just sort of like, I all, I feel like Bravo's done such a good job over the years of proving that like, even if a franchise is not doing well, eventually it might take three to four years. Eventually it's going to come back around. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Because we saw that with Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, OC. OC, um, yeah. Jersey was bad for a little bit there and then had a really good run. Like a lot of these shows do come back around and we just have this sort of recency bias in terms of how we talk about everything. Mm. Um. So yeah, I d and and yeah, if I have a super negative thing to talk to today, like I either want to like take a like wait a beat to say it or, uh -huh. you know. Do you ever feel like some of the other Bravo accounts though are, I, I, so like there's, there's, a, there's a tweet I saw about Roni right now from one of these accounts and it says, from the petty feuds to the personal storylines and luxury lifestyles, this season of Roni is only two episodes in and we are just enjoying every single oh. second. Well, that's just not and, true. Right. And so sometimes I see this from some of the Bravo accounts and I'm like, I, it's giving paid. I know it's not paid, but sometimes I wonder if there's an effort from some of these accounts to be like overly optimistic in order right. to be in the good graces of Bravo. Yeah, no, I I try not to do that. Like, that's not something that I I try to really share my honest thoughts. Um, that to me is like just not really an accurate portrayal. Like, like objectively speaking, of what's going on in Roni right now. Um, yeah, and I, like I I do try to find the positive in like a in like a not as good season. Like, for example, like Potomac last season was not good, and like I'm and it's just kind of the common consensus on where that franchise was. And like this season is probably not going to be some iconic season, but it's definitely on the right track to sort of yeah. figuring that show back out again. Um, but yeah, I, it's a hard line. It's a hard line to balance, but I do think I know personally for my, my friends at Bravo, that's like, they appreciate some of the, uh, some of the sort of like the critical thinking on these shows because they know that I'm coming from a place of liking the shows and wanting them to succeed. And so if I, when I pick my moments to be really critical, I really mean it, you know, and it's yeah. not, it's not like just, cause I feel like some of these people, some accounts like really just, it seems like they want everybody to fail and they want everybody fired and they want the franchises not to succeed. And like, I don't know. It's a balance as you know, as you know, cause yeah. Is that something that you deal with too? Like the, I don't know, putting your, obviously putting your honest thoughts out, but like having to skate that line. Well, you are on my close friends. So you know that I That's sort of true. have, I, That's true. that was something that I created a few months ago because I was feeling like I couldn't offer up my opinions because I think this just happens with anyone. Like when the it scale does. of your audience grows, it I does. know this is something that Charlie XCX spoke about in her recent interview with Zane Lowe, which mm -hmm. was that like all of a sudden as she started to blow up this past summer, she was, uh, there was a scrutiny around the things that she said, things that were just kind of throwaway comments that were all of a sudden dissected. And I'm not comparing myself to Charlie XCX in any sense, but I know that like, I know that because of the wider net that I have now, things can easily be, and also there are a lot of bad faith viewers about about anything, whether exactly. it be like social media posts for me or housewives or what have you. So I think for me, creating that close friends was really helpful for me because some of the quick thoughts that I have, like I still have an outlet to express them. And for me, that's often what it is. Like something is in my head and I feel the need to get it out. It's not about projecting it to however many people. No, it's about it's having, not having an outlet. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. that to me has been very cathartic. But yeah, it's definitely something I think about. And I definitely hold my tongue on a lot of things, but I also think one of the great things about being in my thirties is, and this is something that like extends beyond just social media and housewives. Mm -hmm. I don't feel the need to express my opinion Decatur. Yeah, often, oh, no, but too. even just, yeah. but even just yeah, express, yeah, yeah. It's like, I'm very comfortable seeing something. I mean, I just saw Wicked the other day and immediately afterwards, everyone, when I was posting that online, was like, what did you think? And I was like, I haven't even formulated my opinion. I mean, I have like my quick take, sure. But I, sometimes I, I, it's, I enjoy like not having an opinion about something. And oftentimes like I'll see 
something that I think there's an expectation for someone like me to have a feeling about. And sometimes it, if it doesn't evoke a feeling in for, it, for me, it's very okay to like not yeah. say anything. Or yeah, marinate like, in like it. That. Or yeah, it's like I used to feel pressure to like live post about all the episodes. And I'm like, I'm not, that. that's just going to result in like, really like, you know, half-hearted thoughts or like no critical thinking at all. Like I'd rather post two tweets about how a season is doing versus like 20 in an hour, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's sort of, uh, yeah, I totally know what you're saying. It's kind of like that, that clip from Las Culturistas that went viral with Tina Fey yes, talking about absolutely. Yang. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, that like, same thing. And, and, and you and I have messages about this where it's like, I am not hot on Roni right now at all, mm -hmm. but I am friends with Andy. I'm friends with Jenna. Yeah. I am rooting for the success of this show. So I don't feel the need to be like hating on the show. I I am like, I, I when I find great moments, I love to post about them. For me, it's like, I don't have much, many great things to say about Roni in its present state. So more often than not, I'll just say nothing. Yeah. Um, because I'm not rooting for the downfall of this show. I want this show to succeed. And so I think that's what sort of like discerns the fan, like the kinds of fandom that exist today, which is there are, I, mean, I, I think the consensus is more or less that like, we're not loving Roni right now, but I think there's a divide between those who are like dancing on the grave of Roni and those exactly. who are kind of like, okay, to your earlier point, like let's give it some time to cook. Yeah, exactly. And some of there hasn't been a Bravo show other than Salt Lake City, which kind of right out the gate was was a banger of a show. Like there hasn't been a Bravo show that hasn't taken three to sometimes four seasons to really solidify itself. I mean, mm -hmm. that's sort of the that's sort of the norm. So it's been, this is it's been a season and two episodes of this new show of this new cast. And I think that let's give it some time. Let's give it some space. But I, yeah. but I think when, when I do say when I do post things or talk about it on here and am critical about it, it is like basically like you guys should be doing this. Like this, this is me like giving you a pointer. I, I've, I've never been a housewife, but I've studied these shows for so long that like I know a little bit what you're doing wrong. Yeah. The hard thing is, though, because Salt Lake City was so successful from the outset, it sets a precedent that yeah. despite if it's real or not, it's what a lot of people feel where they're like, always going to be comparing it and being like, well, if something new comes along, it's like, well, why can't you be as electric as Salt Lake City was out the gate? I know. I know. And it, I don't even want it to be Salt Lake. I, I would love for it to be the, the sort of fashion adjacent franchise, but I just need it to be feel just like 30 to 40% more authentic <laughs> and yeah, forthcoming. I think, I think for me, what, what I'll be really curious to see, and again, like we've only seen two episodes of this season of Roni. Um, I'll be curious to see coming out of this season. And like I said, we don't we don't know the trajectory of this season, but I'll be curious what happens next. Cause I was mm -hmm. surprised, I'll admit, that they stuck with all the same cast and obviously Me too. you know made some additions, but I was surprised that there wasn't a a bigger shakeup. And and I've 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 always been surprised that they didn't court like a bit, you know, for instance, with uh, going into this new season of Beverly Hills, it's like, we're all excited because Jennifer Tilly is finally going to be on the show. I'm surprised that they didn't gun for like a, another big name of the Jenna level, not, not the Minkoff level to sort of like anchor the show. Someone that would like, there would just be intrigue around having her on the show. I know for many of us, you know, the dream would be Wendy Williams. That's not going to yeah. happen, but like, but even like, I've been talking about this with um, our mutual Dan and Brendan who hosts the mm -hmm. iconic Come Through Queen podcast. My dream is to have Nini join the cast of New York. Um, really? Rather than come back to Atlanta. That to me is my dream. And so like, I want someone to come into New York who comes in with built-in iconography. Um, I think that would be the really exciting next move for Ferroni. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a contingent of people who want that to happen. I don't think you engage with Summer House, but there's people who sort of want people to graduate from that into Roni. That's been another kind of pe faction of people, yeah. which is an interesting idea, but it's a totally different yeah. show. But, you know, they, they they have eight years under their belt, some of them. Yeah, I like that. Make it like these other shows are kind of like breeding grounds and you graduate into it. I'm here for that. Again, like I didn't know who Kate Chastain was watching The Traders, and I came away from it being like, okay. Like, I, and I, I loved her. Yeah, so... I, I have the mindset, like, just because I don't know the thing doesn't mean it's not great. And I think if anything, what we've learned from the success of the traders is like, there's so much room for a crossover. People love a crossover. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's a, a great next step. I know a lot of people have wanted Sheena. Uh, again, I, I've never- right. And Lala. I've only yeah. seen, 
one of two episodes of Vanderpump Rules, but I know wow. a lot of people want Sheena. So like, I would be very for that. Like, yeah, right. do it. Right. Yeah. It, it, they almost need, they need a reality star, basically. So yeah. <laughs> somebody should, should show, show everybody else the ropes, basically. That's exactly what we're getting at. Right. Well, Evan, this has been a great convo. Do you have any other lingering thoughts about the Roni of it all or housewives in general? Do I have any lingering thoughts? I yeah. guess what I am curious to see is because, yeah. you know, there was a dark period that where we didn't have a lot of housewives on the air and what we had wasn't necessarily giving. And Roni is not in the best shape right now. And as you said, and I think people agree, like, I don't know if we're set up for the most success with this season of Potomac and Jersey has no plans to resume production. And so I think we're all thankful for Salt Lake City in this present moment. But what I'm curious about is looking down the barrel totally. uh, with Beverly Hills and Atlanta coming out next. I think there's a lot of pressure on both of those franchises, because if they fail to deliver, and I have no reason to think that they will, but if they do, I think it will, there will start to be a larger conversation around Housewives. where Housewives goes. And so I'm, and, and as someone who is rooting for the continuation of Housewives, I'm really like, I, I've, there's, I think there's a lot of pref, unspoken pressure on those two franchises to deliver big. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the other really healthy one right now is OC, but um, it's kind of lightning in a bottle right now. So it's sort of like, how do you sustain that? So I agree. It's, we have, we go through these cyclical moments, I think with, with the franchises and uh, obviously I want it to, I want it to continue and succeed. So, and I think that they'll, they'll find some way to move forward for, for all of them, but I don't know, Evan, thank you for being here. Anything you want to plug before we uh, sign off? Anything I want to plug? No, I would say I'll have a big announcement of some variety coming in December. Okay. Relevant to something that I often cover on my oh, social channels. I, I, th I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm not going to say anything. So everybody get excited. Yes. <laughs> also, your apartment is so clean. Oh, thank you. It's uh... yeah, I'm just really impressed with your cleanliness. Thank you so much color code of books. Um, Evan, I appreciate you doing this. I really, really do. Um, we'll talk again soon. All right. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I want to gab. 